We're working through the series of victory over temptation. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 4. Past couple weeks, we looked at the first uh, four verses. In the first week, we looked at the first two, being prepared to serve God. And then we looked at verses 3 and 4, dealing with the first temptation that was happening. Now we're doing, dealing with the second temptation that is happening here with Jesus. Because here where Jesus went into the desert and he was facing these different temptations, many times we want to say that God doesn't understand. God doesn't know. But he's showing us in these scriptures that he does know, he does understand our struggles. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a, mount, <clears throat> in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. When we look at verses 5, one of the things we have to notice here, the first thing is Satan is in the enticement. He shows the world's possessions and the world's glory. Many times we want to look out and we want to see what the world has to offer us. We can see all the lights, all the money, all the fame. We can see the things we see on TV. We can read the things we read in the newspaper. We can see the luxuries that people have when we drive by their homes. We can see the luxuries they have when we see all the possessions they own. And many times when we look at that, we try to understand, why do I not have that? How come they have this, but I don't? And Satan, many times, he wants to take those things and dangle them out in front of us to entice us that we may have and possess those things. But one of the things that happened here is the devil took him and showed him all the kingdoms. Satan took Jesus up high so he could look way out. He didn't take him down in the valley and say, now look over here at this mountain. Now look over here behind you at this other mountain. No, because his sight would have been limited if he was down in the valley. Satan took him up where his sight was not limited, where he could see to the horizon this way, to the horizon that way, and that way and that way. He could see the horizons all around him. Do you realize when you look out and you see those horizons, one of the things in which Satan is doing here, he's showing him everything. And he's trying to tell him, this can be yours. The second thing that we're going to look at is Satan's claims. He controls the world and its glory. Do you notice here in verse 6, it says, and said to him, to you I will give all the authority and their glory. Satan is right here trying to say to Jesus, he says, look, I own all the authority here on this, this, this right here, and, and I have all this glory, and all this can be yours. Do you really believe that? I mean, you think about that. This is the Son of God into whom he's speaking to. And Satan is making these claims that he has control of the world. That he has control of all its glory. Because when we look there in verse 6, it says, To you I will give all authority and its glory. Now think about that. Do you realize that Satan tempts you and me every day? That when things are out there that aren't meant for us, they may be meant for someone else, but they may not be meant for you or for me. But Satan tries to say, you just put yourself to the side and you just go over there and you just go get it. How many times have we been tempted maybe to pick up something, stick it in your pocket and walk out when it's not even yours to take? 
You see, when there's things out there in front of you that's tempting you, it's not even yours to take. But Satan's trying to say, hey, it's his. He owns it. And he says, hey, because I own it, you can have it. But when we look at this verse, Satan is making claims that are not true. And I got news for you. He makes claims to you and he makes claims to me every day that aren't true. Now look at the last part of verse 6. The next part, the third thing that we notice is Satan's offer. One of the things he does here in verse 6, he will give the world to whomever he wills. Notice here in the last part of verse 6. It says, For it has been given... Let me start over. For it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. Satan is telling him, he says, I offer to you all this, all this glory, all the things in which the world possess. It has been given to me, he's trying to say, and he says, I will give it to you. You see, it was not even Satan's to offer. He makes the claims. He makes the lies. He makes the promises that aren't even close to being close to a truth. And when we notice this, the offer that Satan's making and the claim that he's making are just crazy. But when we look at this offer that he's trying to give Jesus, think about many times with yourself. I know with me, there's been times when things sounded too good to be true. And and that's when your red flags need to start going up. That's when you need to start cautioning and you need to slow your roll a little bit. Because when things start sounding too good to be true, odds are they are. Do you realize here in verse 6, everything is sounding too good to be true? The offer and the claim that Satan is doing to Jesus. They both sound too good to be true. Check this out. They're not true. They're not even close to truth. Now look at our next point. Satan's conditions. Look at verse 7. A person must worship and follow him. There in verse 7 he says, If you then... Now check this out. If you, comma, he addresses Jesus and he pauses... He says, if you, he's getting Jesus' attention. He's not wanting Jesus to look around nowhere. He says, if you, he's trying to get Jesus' attention. If you, then, another comma. Do you notice the hesitations here in this verse? It's if you, getting his attention, and he's saying, then, comma, then the next thing's, will worship me, comma. He's going to stop right there when he's making this statement to Jesus. He says, if you, then worship me. And he continues with the verse, it will be yours. Verse 6, we just talked about how it was too good to be true. The offer and the claim. But now, the thing that's happening. Check out what is happening there in that verse. Satan is throwing some conditions on Jesus. He says, now look, you looked as far as you could look, this way, this way, that way, this way, all the way around you, Jesus. And and I'm telling you, all this can be yours. Verse 6, he says, but, here's a condition, for all that to be yours, you have to do one thing. Let's back up time just a minute. Let's back up to Genesis. Adam and Eve. You know, he started talking to Eve and he always made everything to sound so good. But then he always throws in that one condition. When you look at things that Satan does, he paints a picture before you and me. And each one of us have a different temptation. I'm tempted different than you. You're tempted different than me. But where you and I struggle, Satan will paint a picture in front of us before we start struggling with it. And it looks real good. And it's like it's wanting to entice us to fall to that temptation. 
But the moment that we know we're about to do it, he says, this can be yours, but there's one condition. There's always a condition. And when we check this out, he's telling Jesus, his condition is, you have to worship me. And Jesus knows, and he's showing then in this condition, this is nonsense. This is craziness. In the last verse that here we're going to look at tonight in verse 8, Jesus gives Satan an answer. Do you realize that in those previous verses, it's Satan, 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 time after time. Do you notice that Jesus isn't putting a, a stop to the nonsense? Do you notice there, you don't see anywhere there in verse 5, that there's a stop to nonsense. You don't see a stop to nonsense in verse 6. You don't see a stop to nonsense in verse 7. Jesus is remaining silent. Now, I don't know about you, but I probably wouldn't have been able to hold my tongue that long. I would have probably had to said something. But Jesus, He held His tongue. And then in this point, Jesus' answer he must worship and follow God alone. That's what Jesus is telling them in verse 8. Verse 8 says, And Jesus answered him, It is written. It's not Jesus' word. It's not Jesus' opinion. But it is scriptural. Jesus is quoting from the Old Testament what God had laid upon the prophets to write down. And, and Jesus is quoting this and He said, You shall worship the Lord your God in Him alone you shall serve. Do you realize that Jesus says, I'm giving you an answer and I'm showing you right here in the midst of all these things you're tempting me with, Satan, I turn them down. I say no to the temptation, but I say yes to the Lord. I say yes to the Lord. And check out what he says in the last part of this that he's quoting. He doesn't say about worship. He even ends it with, Him alone shall you serve. Many times we think about, it's all about just worshiping the Lord. And worshiping the Lord is very important but it's just as important as is serving the Lord. Amen. Our serving the Lord is part of our worship. The way we serve the Lord reflects our worship unto Him. So my question to you tonight is, in the book of James it tells us, if we say we're without sin, we make God out to be a liar. Well, I'm here to tell you, you and I both have sin in our lives. You and I both are not perfect. Odds are, those sins that are in our life are contributed to temptation. But we're allowed to get the best of us. So my question to you is, tonight, what are you going to say to Satan? when He throws that temptation in your face tonight? What are you going to say to Him next week when He throws that temptation in your face? Are you going to allow it to entice you and pull you right in? Or are you going to say no? I'm not going to allow that to be the Lord of my life. I'm not going to allow that to be my God. But I am going to step away from that temptation and I'm going to say no to the temptation. I'm going to say yes to the Lord. I'm going to let Him be the Lord and God of my life. And to Him I will worship. To Him I will serve. Because you know what? When you and I say yes to temptation, we're serving the temptation. We're not serving God. So my challenge to you is, what are you going to do? when you're face to face with that temptation? You're going to say yes to it and no to the Lord? Or are you going to step back and say no to the temptation and yes to the Lord? Let's pray. Father, 
What an incredible picture you painted here in these.